was a thorn grabbed my hand on the, on the way up. Look at that. Still got one of the little thorns in my hand. An occupational hazard. I used to get them all the time when I was doing tours. Daily occurrence. Right here's where I'm going. Well, hello everyone, and welcome to the channel. Uh, yeah, I am, as you can see, standing on a mountain in southern West Virginia on a random mountainside inside a bramble of tangled up thorns and yucca plants and down trees and great big trees and all sorts of stuff. I'm actually camping. Uh, about a thousand yards from here something like that and uh, this is one of the things that we wanted to do while I was out here today um, this particular grave right here a friend of mine Keith Gibson showed me this graveyard a couple weeks ago and we ran across something we found really interesting and I think you guys might as well Today, we're doing on a story on several men who were gunned down in broad daylight during an election in the streets of the remote, lawless mountain town of West Virginia. Countless people witnessed it, and it was the talk of the town and the center of much despair and heartache for many. as well as a source of anger for others. Over 100 years ago, people stood together here as two men were lowered into one grave together, a nephew and his uncle. Now, this gravesite sits hidden from view until today. We actually had no idea who this was, but after a long time digging and researching, it finally came to light who we had found thanks to my friend Keith Gibson who owns this land and you know like I said showed me this cemetery we had almost given up on figuring out who these men were as one side simply reads J.E. and the other side reads Elliot Rutherford November 3rd 1896 hang on let me get over there I tried to snap a little bit of this stuff out of the way so you guys can see this better let me try to get it on angle Elliot Rutherford okay okay right here and on the back side get through the brush here through the brambles it's really thick here J.E. Rutherford. Okay. Now, let me get back out of this mess. Let me back out of here. Very tight little spot. I got just enough room. Just that is the only space I've got really to get in there. Anyway, like I said, it reads about... Uh, the Elliot Rutherford and the date November 3rd 1896 but that date that was familiar you see William Anderson Cap Hatfield who was the second oldest son of clan patriarch Anderson Devil Ants Hatfield and arguably the most violent of the participants in the now infamous Hatfield McCoy feud in the spring of 1895, Cap had acquired a tract of land and moved his wife, Nancy, and their children from the head of Island Creek in neighboring Logan County to the small town of Mate One at the confluence of the Tug Fork River and Mate Creek in 
the new Mingo County, which had just recently been formed that same year from portions of old Logan County. Although the town was located in the southern borderlands of West Virginia, uh, Mate One had much more in common with unruly cow towns of the western frontier than it did with a modern village on the east coast. An isolated and lawless region, Mate One still had occasional gun battles in the streets. It was a place where mountain or vigilante justice still ruled the day with an iron fist. It was now the location of a daily Norfolk and Western train stop and even had its own depot. But even so, lawless law enforcement in this region was still very inadequate and at most times non-existent. People mostly took care of their own problems in their own way. Cap had been in the timber business since he was little, mostly working for his workaholic father, Devil Ants, who owned approximately 5,000 wooded acres across the mountain along Main Island Creek. Cap's intentions were to live near town for a while to be closer to a new sawmill built on Mate Creek. Most noted and most brutal Hatfield, of the Hatfield-McCoy feud events had already happened. Yet, even as late as the mid-1890s, for Cap, the memories of the feud were still very much alive as Eastern detectives and unlawful posses from Kentucky and so-called peace officers continued to flood into West Virginia seeking the remaining rewards on the heads of Devil Ants and his sons, Johnsy and Cap, and several other family members and supporters. Because of that, Cap, who had been active feuded, lived a life of continual suspicion. Paranoid, therefore he remained heavily armed at all times and aware of his surroundings. Local citizens already knew he was a man to be reckoned with, and most gave him and his family a wide berth. Historian Virgil Carrington Jones once wrote about him, People look at Cap with awe. They said among themselves, He had a record probably unparalleled by any other living person that he had killed at least 18 men at one time or another. But as it always is, down in town there lived another man with an equally fierce reputation often called the Bully of Mate One by locals. His name was John E. Rutherford, this gentleman right here. He was the adult son of Dr. Elliot Doc Rutherford. Doc Rutherford had once been a loyal friend of Devil Ants and the Hatfield clan before black, bad blood got between them. Devil Ants had, in fact, named his son Elliot after the physician. Family contentions began a couple years earlier when Doc got into a showdown with John Chafin, a first cousin of Levisi Chafin Hatfield, Devil Ants' wife and Cap's mother. In the violent encounter, Chafin received a 38 slug to the spine, which crippled him for life. Strong resentment grew from the incident. There were further hard feelings between John Rutherford and the Hatfields, because of the claim by Rutherford that sometime prior to the election of 1896, Cap had shot up his house, which Cap denied. According to writings and documentation of Coleman A. Hatfield, a historian and Cap's son, around mid-September of 1896, John Rutherford told a crowd of Democratic volunteers at a saloon in Pike County across the river from Mate One that Cap Hatfield, who was one of the few Republicans in the area, was making a stir, trying to convert citizens to his political persuasion. If Cap comes to make one and votes the Republican ticket, Rutherford growled, let's put him over in Kentucky. You see, old feud charges 
persisted in the bluegrass state, and bounties remained on the heads of many of the Hatfields. So putting a Hatfield over into Kentucky meant turning Cap over to legal authorities over there. If tried there, he could be hanged for murder charges stemming from the 1882 murder of three McCoy boys and the 1888 New Year's surprise attack on Randall McCoy's cabin that resulted in the killing of two of his children, Calvin and Alifair McCoy, and the ruthless beating of his wife, Sally. Within days of the saloon gathering, multiple gunshots struck Rutherford's Mate One home. This was the backdrop when Cap arrived at the Mate One polling place on Election Day on November 3rd in 1896. Elections along the borderline had not changed significantly since the 1860s. People still con congregated around the poles and at the edges of town. Many drank heavily, some argued politics, while others, stoned out of their heads, wrestled and fought with each other over anything. While many onlookers came just to watch the show, other locals came to enjoy the mountain music with dulcimers, fiddles, harmonicas, and guitars. Others clogged, uh, clogged or square danced and picnicked and participated in the social events and party-like atmosphere on election day. On this particular afternoon, everyone was in town when Cap, carrying his lever action, strolled into the grounds and mingled among the crowd. Cap's son, Joe Glenn, tagged along, carrying the double-barreled shotgun his stepfather had recently bought, for, bought him for hunting squirrels and wild turkeys. They eventually came on the mercantile owned by Doc Rutherford here, where he and his son, John, and others stored their moonshine whiskey on such occasions. Bliss Rutherford, John's older brother, uh, leaned against a wooden column on the porch of the store, obviously drunk, and shouted, Cap, I'm surprised you had the guts to come down here today. I can smell the stench on you from here. Angered by the insult, Cap stopped abruptly and turned around and just stared at Bliss. At that moment, John Rutherford stepped out of the store and joined his brother. John reached around and grabbed a 38 caliber pistol from a bucket sitting on the porch. Throwing one toward Cap, he said, Pick that up, Cap. I might have to kill some man today. John, there's no glory in killing, Cap replied, as he tried to control his notorious temper. I wouldn't want to hurt anybody, and I wouldn't want to see you hurt anyone either. Best to let bygones be bygones. For a few tense moments, the adversaries stared each other down until John finally looked away and grabbed Bliss by the arm. The brothers walked back down to the mercantile. Cap relaxed, shrugged his shoulders, and walked on. Toward evening, Cap cast his ballot for the Republicans, regardless of the partisan jokes and negative comments old friends had made throughout the day. After voting, a friend met up with Cap and put his arm on his shoulder and said, Cap, let's go get something to eat. Just then, all hell broke loose. A drunk John Rutherford stepped out of the store shouting, Look here, Cap Hatfield, look here. Rutherford fired his shotgun twice. One wild shot cut the skin off the top of Cap's left ear and the other shot blistered him across the base of the neck. Blood flowed from the wounds. In the book, The Tale of the Devil, Cap's son later wrote about the events. Dad was an awful quick man. He shot Rutherford along his right side just as Rutherford pulled a pistol from his holster and began firing again. Within seconds of Rutherford's first gunshot, uh, the election grounds had exploded with as many as four other men now shooting handguns, including 
Reese Halsey, Ed Hopkins, Lou Rutherford, and Elliot Rutherford. Running out to the steps of the poll, uh, an election official named Henderson Chambers yelled, Pour it on him, Johnny, pour it on him. At that instant, a shotgun blast hit Chambers in the chest, and he dropped backwards. Okay, sorry about that. My legs were going to sleep. <laughs> I had to stand up and stretch for just a second. Needed a battery anyway. All right, anyway, where were we? All right, yeah. See, some people at the scene later said that, uh, that Joe Glenn fired the fatal shot though Glenn denied the accusation. Cap grasped uh, Glenn's double barrel shotgun from him as he tossed his Winchester. As they switched weapons, a stray bullet ricocheted off the shotgun and shattered on the barrel. Lead fragments flew into Cap's hand, leaving his knuckles bleeding. Joe Glenn lunged toward Cap, screaming, Pa! Let's get away from here. They'll kill you. Cap and Joe spun and ran for a nearby alley in the direction of the railroad tracks and the road that led back out of Mate One. They exited the alleyway and sprinted through town and over to the dirt road, turned and headed up the tug fork to the mouth of the creek bed. Shooting wildly, Ed Rutherford and several others chased them with uh, chased them to a wooden railroad trestle that was built over the roadway. Elliot Rutherford, standing on top of the trestle, emptied two p pistols at Cap, who was squatted at the large support beams below. As Joe Glenn simultaneously ran ahead another 75 yards up Mate Creek, when Cap found an opportunity to flee his position, he turned and fired his shotgun at Reese Halsey, shooting him in the foot, slicing off three of his toes. Uh, once he reloaded, Elliot Rutherford, from his vantage point toward the top of the trestle, fired at least two, two more pistol shots that hit the ground between Joe Glenn's feet. Cap sprinted toward the boy as Joe fired a shot from Cap's Winchester that whizzed over Rutherford's head. As he met up with his stepson, Cap threw the double barrel shotgun at Joe's feet. He grabbed his rifle from the boy and fired a second shot, directly through Rutherford's heart. His lifeless body collapsed over the edge of the trestle and nosedived to the ground below. Turning, Cap shouted, Take to the woods! They burst into action again and ran through the gun smoke as bullets zinged overhead. Cap and Joe uh, crossed the dry bed and ran through the dense thicket and charged up a steep hillside. When they finally got to the top of the ridge, they dove into the thick underbrush, thorns, twi twigs, and just sat there on the top of the bridge. As uh, they maneuvered and crawled even deeper into the brush and brambles, now out of sight, they were able to pause and catch their breath uh, along the wood line. The gunfire below finally ceased. They had a clear view from the hillside down into town through the camouflage of the vegetation protecting them from being detected. They could easily see the remaining crowds outside the poles. Cap and Joe remained motionless and listened to the ongoing commotion below. Dogs were barking, men were, men were swearing, women were still shrieking from the excitement of the gunfire, while others were crying from the death of loved ones. After hours had passed, Cap nudged Joe and whispered, We can go to Dan Christian's. Dan was a longtime friend of the Hatfields. He lived uh, nearly family, having practically been raised by Devil Anson of Icy. Out of fear of being caught, though, the pair remained in the woods for the rest of the day and the next. Before starting their nighttime journey, they scrambled down into the gullies where it was most difficult to travel. Joe led Cap, who was blind in one eye from a childhood accident. A percussion cap had exploded 
which caused him to have great difficulty seeing in the dark. They eventually arrived at Dan Christian's home. There they slept in the attic crawl space and Christian's daughter brought them their first meal since the shooting began two days earlier. While Cap and Joe hid out at Dan Christian's home for several days, a posse from Mate One, roughly 25 men on horseback, led by Reese Chambers and Bill Bevins, rode throughout the area looking for the two men. Posse members raided Cap's nearby cabin, and Reese Chambers demanded to know if he was hiding inside. Nan, Cap's wife, met the posse members from her front porch and said she knew nothing of the trouble or of Cap's whereabouts. The party searched the home, outbuildings, and the grounds. When they exhausted their search, they traveled over to the mountain to the main island creek where they questioned Devil Ants Hatfield as well. Unable to find or track Cap or Joe, the posse eventually returned to mate one empty-handed at nightfall. The next night, Dan Christian hid Cap and Joe beneath a heavy canvas tarp in the back of his wagon and hauled them up the mountain of Thacker Creek, where they traveled along the railroad tracks at a water stop. The N&W locomotive came to its regular stop there around midnight. While the train took on water, Cap and Joe climbed on board and hid in a baggage car. After the train pulled out, it gathered steam and passed right through Mate 1 at a high rate of speed. It never stopped again until it arrived at the depot in the city of Huntington, nearly a hundred miles away. Cap and Joe surrendered to the county sheriff, who set them up to stay at the Arlington Hotel with the understanding that they would turn themselves in the next day in Mingo County. The following morning, Jim Clark, an investigator and trusted friend of Cap's, arrived in Huntington, accompanied by Dan Christian. Clark, who agreed with the sheriff, explained that Cap uh, explained to Cap that he would have to stand trial, which he would be heard by the judge of Mingo Circuit some months later. He then escorted Cap and Joe back to Mingo County. Later, Hatfield family members indicated that when Cap stood trial, 11 of the jury members were in favor of acquitting him because he had been attacked and fired on first during the election day event. They believed that Cap not only protected himself and the aggressors began the fight, but there was one elderly man on the jury who argued that so many men had been killed that day that he thought the verdict ought to be manslaughter either way. The jurors who didn't want to have the report that they were a hung jury ultimately brought in the verdict of involuntary manslaughter, which carried a light jail term. Joe Glenn was sent to reform school at Prunytown, a correctional center for boys, and Cap was incarcerated at the jailhouse in Williamson, the county seat of Mingo County. But their story doesn't end there. Oh no. It turned into Cap breaking out of jail and going on the run with his younger brothers Elias and Troy who were now accused of murder of Dave Kenny in Logan County but that's a whole nother story for a whole nother day because today's story is about the men whose story stopped on November 3rd in 1896 Elliot Rutherford here and his uncle John E. Rutherford, or as we see here, simply J.E. Now, is that not the wildest story you have ever heard? And you know what? It's all true. It sounds like something right out of a Hollywood movie. Anyway, all right. I've been here a while. I, I need to get out of here and move a little bit. All I've got is just this one little spot here that you can't even really stand up in. Amazing story. Amazing history. Buried right here in all of this overgrowth. Look at that, how thick. 
That's got to go back down that way. That's the way I came in. I have to go back that way. Let's see. Look at that. That's where I'm going. Alright guys, anyway, thank y'all for coming along. I, I really hope you enjoyed our little story today. Had a little bit of everything. A little bit of adventure, a little bit of a Hatfield McCoy feud. Even had a jailbreak at the end. Very much hope you guys enjoyed our story today. Thank you for coming along. And we will see you next time. From inside the thorns and brambles on a mountainside in southern West Virginia. We'll see you guys next time. Leo out.